Hey, thank you today for checking out the podcast. I'm your host, Coach Chris McMahon, and I'm really excited today to get to sit down and talk with Jeb Johnston. Now, for those of you who don't know him, he is a health coach, health coach, uh, board cert pending, based in Charleston, South Carolina. He has his wife, Sarah, his two dogs, Brigsby and Georgia, and he focuses on behavior change uh, to lead to better health outcomes, which is really, really interesting and really important, especially for intentional weight loss and the weight neutral community. And he's worked with over a thousand clients over the last decade. He's written for major publications such as Men's Fitness, Muscle and Fitness, Men's Journal and Business Insider, as well for other online publications like On It and Barbend. So thank you so much, Jeb, for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, so I think, I think the thing that I'm curious about uh, because I, if folks aren't following you on social media, you post some interesting things. And one of the themes that I see consistently popping up with what you talk about is this idea of like weight neutral and intentional, intentional weight loss, like that differentiation. And I, I was hoping maybe you could dive in and explain the difference between the two, because I, you know, there's two ends of the spectrum with everything. And I think what you're really talking about kind of exists in the middle, the messy middle of things. And I think it's actually really, really powerful. Um, so if you could maybe dive into that a little bit. Well, and, you know, which the, the first thing in like intentional weight loss, uh, you know, I, I'm also pretty intentional with my words and my uh, descriptors as it can be a, a polarizing thing to talk about um, nutrition and uh I understand because I've been at both sides of the pendulum where I worked solely in intentional weight loss and a very specific kind of, here's your numbers, here's what you do to lose weight, calorie deficit, you know, is, is, is what makes the, the weight loss happen. And so that's all that matters. And then I've swung to the other side where I was like, wow, I, you know, this could be extremely damaging. I, I worry about, you know, the, the uh, long-term effects of this type of dieting. And so therefore maybe, you know, none of these things are okay. And then finding kind of my place in the middle where, um, you know, and the reason I use intentional weight loss and weight neutral strategies as my kind of pendulum swing is because um, more often than not, we will hear people discuss uh, either diet culture, anti-diet culture, diet, anti-diet. Um, there's one side that says that diets don't work on 100, you know, 100% of the time diets never work. Um, and there's another side that says, like, all you have to do is eat less, move more, and, and, and we wouldn't have an obesity epidemic. And, and the reality is that, that obesity overweight um, is it's not a moral uh, uh, situation. It's not a judgment call. But there does seem to be some correlations between uh, obesity, overweight, and less productive health outcomes in the long term. Now, again, you know, we can look at a lot of uh, uh, newer research coming out that we see better outcomes in people, even if they're overweight or obese, um, when they are engaged in higher levels of physical activity. But the majority of people that are engaging in those higher levels of physical activity um, are going to not really fit into this narrative anyway. So, so generally what happens is, is we have one side um, that is, you know, says that, that losing weight or trying to lose weight is morally wrong and we should not ever do it. And you have another side that says being overweight is morally wrong and both are, are completely missing the mark. And so we, I think the, the, the best of our practitioners find somewhere to kind of meet in the middle. And so when I talk about intentional weight loss, I talk about people who are like, I have a desire to lose weight for whatever reason that may be. It's not my job as a practitioner to uh, assign someone their own values and their own reasons for doing something um, or someone, you know, someone who I might work with that has worked on intentional weight loss for most of their lives has not seen the outcomes that they want, or they have seen incredible outcomes only to regain the weight and, 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 and have a lot of kind of psychological and behavioral misgivings about their history of dieting. And so then we work on what we call weight neutral approaches, which are things that have nothing to do with weight loss. They have nothing to do with um, intentionally trying to be a, a smaller body size and all to do with behaviors that are health seeking, health seeking behaviors, and how we can find better health outcomes without tying things to the scale. Now, does that sometimes lead to uh, weight loss? Absolutely. Um, oftentimes it does. The intent is not there, though. The intent is to to um, develop a 
better relationship with food, um, a better relationship with exercise, uh, and just a more health determination all around, whether that be mental health, social health, uh, physical health, all these things. I think it's such an important distinction that you're making here, uh, especially in this idea of like, if a client comes to me and says, I want to lose weight, or I don't want to lose weight, and I just want to be however they're defining healthier. It's not distinctly tied to their moral standings within society, because I think that is what both ends of the spectrum sometimes I don't want to generalize, but are missing out on. It's the idea that it's it's either demonizing or categorizing someone's goals or specific wants in this way that that minimalizes whatever their story is, whatever their values are, whatever is truly important in their life. So I I, I truly resonate with what you're saying. And I'm hoping folks hearing this from you, having worked with thousands of clients, like this is the beautiful thing. This is the beautiful thing about how we get to exist as humans is like we can really tap into that. And that's where someone can thrive, right? It's it's the concept of like, okay, I'm gonna lose these 10 pounds, but after I lose the 10 pounds, oh, guess what? I'm still me. I mm-hmm. it, it doesn't change me. It doesn't, the transformation is physical. It's not necessarily emotional, mental, well-being wise a transformation. And that's that's usually the folks who do end up, if they do gain the weight back, it's usually because that's that's not been dealt with that hasn't been talked about within our scope of practice, right? There's only so much we can do, but to be honest, someone having a conversation and being able to recognize some of these, we can use the word trigger, we can use the word, um, you know, for folks who are familiar with precision nutrition, they have the concept of like breaking the chain. It's like whatever that, whatever those parts are in that em- emotional well being that are leading to whatever whatever tendencies you have around food, whatever coping mechanisms you're using, you know, it, it, it truly provides like this different avenue. So Jeb, I, I, I would just be fascinated to hear when did sort of that like light switch or light bulb moment go off for you where you were like, okay, I'm, t- I'm on two far ends of the spectrum, right? Because you have the one where it's like, all right, everyone's going to track. And then you have the other where it's like, we're not, you could throw away your scale. We're not really going to look at that. Like, let's, let's do X or Y. Like, how did you come to the realization where it's like, okay, I need to borrow from all of these tools because it's not really a one size fit all thing. Yeah, I'd say um, probably as I kind of progressed in my career and um, it took a while because I had I had to go through a, a cycle of seeing people work with me, lose a lot of weight, and then come back to me and need to lose a lot of weight again. And saying, well, so what didn't work here? Um, why did this, why are we seeing this recidivism? Why do we see so much recidivism within this? Um, and me personally, my personal story is I've never dealt with weight. If any, I mean, I got married, I was 143 pounds, like skinny dude, musician. Like I didn't start lifting weights till I was in my thirties. And I, you know, I put on like, let's see, I went from 145 pounds when I got married to, um, about 205 pounds now. So like, you know, in 10 years I put on like 60 ish pounds of muscle. Um, so for me, it was, you know, it's, it's the opposite, but I was, a uh, I was a pretty bad alcoholic, uh, always you know i had a lot of drug issues uh so i started to view um a lot of these behaviors through the lens of addiction and how the similarities are there um when people have obesity or uh, overweight they are not the food is not the actual thing um, so it's behavioral in nature, it is coping mechanisms. Um, and so I started to say, okay, well, if, if that is the, the, if the issues are emotional, uh, uh, social and not just physiological, why am I trying to utilize this cognitive approach, which is, you know, stemming from a, a really a different place rather than utilizing more emotional regulation, uh, more strategies that would happen within kind of the realm of 
uh, of behavior change. Um, and how, then how do I do that within scope of practice? So from there, I just started to kind of extrapolate how I could work with things. I realized that my biggest deficiency was not in my nutritional knowledge. Uh, you know, I worked with, you know, I'm very lucky in that I have uh, extraordinarily brilliant friends that are very, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, very well recognized in their field. Um, and, and so that, those, I was always a phone call away from pretty much having any answer I need from a, a, a scientific standpoint. Um, that's not what I was missing. So I realized that I needed help in how I coach people better behaviorally. Uh, so I had seen uh, Tony Gentlecore had posted about his wife. Uh, this is a long time ago. They were doing a, a, a seminar together, and his wife is a, a, a clinical psychologist. I'm sorry, she's not a clinical psychologist. She's a psychologist, um, and she worked. She's worked in both the, the addiction field and uh, in the sports psychology field. And I couldn't make it to that seminar, but I kept in the back of my head. I saw she was speaking at a seminar. So I went, I flew out to Kansas City to that specifically to try to meet her and talk to her and see how I could. And we kind of struck up a conversation and then I just started, she started coaching me uh, in how to work kind of behaviorally. And we still work together twice a month. Uh, I'm going to say that's been like three years now. Um, and so through her coaching, uh, I was able to kind of better understand how behavioral health uh is influencing people. I tended towards a clientele, which happens to be like women in their, you know, uh, late thirties to early fifties who struggle with emotional eating. That's who I was drawn to. That's who was drawn to me. So I had a lot of, I was getting a lot of practice and I just started shifting. I started building my own model, uh, started utilizing different, uh, behavioral strategies to work with these people and started building my own kind of skill set of tools to use and started seeing different results and i'm not gonna say better results um because i definitely uh when i just focused on having a lot of clients and and slinging macros like i definitely had a lot more transformations of people that lost 50 100 pounds or whatever um but i would also say i would say about 98 percent of them probably gained uh, most of the way back whereas now the changes are slower they're not as drastic i also don't use transformations in any of my marketing anymore uh, it doesn't fit what i do um but yeah that was it was just a kind of development along that and um working with that clientele i just realized that i needed different skills uh, and i needed and so it was just developing those i, I mostly I, I don't really read basically if i read any nutrition research it's just something that's like uh, hot, a big meta analysis that comes out and almost all the research I read and all the books I read now are almost all psychology uh, texts. I'm also looking, my mom is a psychologist at, at Johns Hopkins. So she actually sends me a lot of materials to read and um, she'll be, you know, she'll see something come across something that looks good and she'll send me a book or something. So um, I have a, I have a pretty solid uh, uh, back backbone and, and help network there. Wow. A lot of that, Jeb, really resonates with me. I'm also sober. Uh, and in process of doing that and in process of working with people and coaching people that I don't know if it's like a similar wavelength where it's like, yeah, I can recognize that maybe this is a superficial goal that we have right now, but there's something bubbling under the surface that's leading to this particular thing. And something that I've been very fortunate to have as well are our mentors or or people that I can ask questions to and someone that I really, really um, enjoy just talking with and, and learning from, and I've been lucky to do that is Josh Hillis. And he's very much in the same realm of, mm -hmm. of uh, the psych psychological part of, of all of this. In particular, he leans heavily into the concept of acceptance commitment therapy the act, which, which really is what resonates most with me um, personally, but also I find that those concepts, whether it be values, whether it be um, being mindful, pausing, actually examining these these ideas that float through our head, like has like the greatest carryover into someone making some sort of change. Because what I've come to find is I as well. I don't. I don't boast transformations. I don't boast any sort of thing like that. Um, because everyone's journey is completely different. You know, it could be someone who's lost like 
50 pounds. But the thing for them is that they can actually have a conversation with someone they care about now without fearing that conversation and then going to the old coping mechanisms. That for the type of person I work with is a, a bigger deal than it doesn't maybe start that way, but then it slowly turns into that. So I, I find it just very, very interesting. So how do you maybe even start this sort of conversation with someone who wants to work with you? Someone, right? Because, because look, you, you, you used to, I, I don't know if you currently do, but I know you worked with like stronger you. And I know that that's like a bigger piece of the puzzle where it's like, okay, we're going to have this transformation and you do it in a way where it's, where it's safe and you can have all of this, this work and everything happen. But this is maybe going to take longer than a year. This is maybe going to take, you know, it takes, it takes more time to really develop those. I want to say a different, a different thought pattern or a different behavior. Yeah, that takes a lot. It takes time. So how do you even begin to have that sort of conversation? Maybe it doesn't even come up in the beginning. Well, you know, that was part of why I chose to leave Stronger You um, is so Mike Dola, one of my closest friends on earth, owner of Stronger You, actually sold it. But um, one of the, the difficult things about me leaving the company was that him and I were so close and I didn't ever want to take it as a personal affront, but I just it was really changing and how I approach things. And it's impossible to do within that that metric. You just can't do it uh, because uh, what I do in my private practice is a lot of pre-qualification. You know, people have to fill out a, an application first. And then we're going to look at some things and we're going to have a conversation. And, and there's a lot of times that it's just not the right fit. And, and um, I'm, and it's not, uh, it, it's not in that it's rejected, but some people want something that I'm just not willing to do because I don't feel it's safe and I don't feel it's, it's, it's in the right, the best interest of that person. And, um, you know, even though I'm not a medical professional, I'm not, I, I take this idea of like, do no harm very, very seriously. Um, because I have made mistakes and I think that I have directly or indirectly contributed in some cases to people having, if not eating disorders, disordered eating patterns. And maybe those things were developed with it without, but, but in, when I was starting out and didn't have the requisite knowledge and doing things that were probably not in the best interest of that client, thinking that they were and not recognizing warning signs, you know, so, and so my biggest concern again is to do no harm. Um, so I, I have a pretty rigorous, uh, you know, kind of application, not for any other reason, but like, I want people to know that it's not going to be um, magic. Like, I'm not going to do anything special. It's like, it's going to be them doing a lot of work and, and, and honestly, like, kind of bullshit work, like things that they're not going to like, like, you know, there's, they're going to have to fill out like, these sheets, like homework and, and do stuff. And in our first, our first meeting, we go through that they, they take a survey um, that like kind of a strength finder type survey so we can see what their personal strengths and weaknesses are. Um, I have them fill out this thing that I, I developed kind of it's, it's a values based action plan as I call it and basically determine their main value and priorities to get some goals set up and to get some action steps within those goals set up so that they have a plan that they've developed basically. Um, yeah, and just so my pre qualification and, and most people coming to me know what they're coming for now. I'm very fortunate in that I don't really advertise. I just kind of people have worked with me in the past or they have friends who work with me and they, you know, I get a lot of uh, um, rec referrals. And um, so, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of focusing now on growing my Instagram presence just because it seems to be unfortunately a, um, a prerequisite to speaking gigs now because, you know, it's not about uh, as much about uh, the content of creation anymore and more about like, Hey, do people follow you? And so that might provide some hiccups in the future. If I, if again, is if that grows to a point where um, more people are seeing it, it and again, at that point, the thing is, I'm, I'm, I have other business interests. So I'm also like lessening my pool of, of clients. So I don't have, I mean, at my height of my career, when I was taking the most clients, I mean, those times I had 200 plus clients. Um, now I, I mean, I think I have 40 and I'll probably by next year, I would like to have no more than 20. Um, and so like that's, and obviously more time dedicated to each of them and, and doing things a little bit differently. I'm going to change my model a little bit, but that's kind of neither here nor there. Um, but yeah, it's this idea of, um, you know, how can we, uh, kind of determine what is going to work best with you. For some people it is like intentional weight loss is fine, but I can look at 
you know, some of the discussions we have and be like, you know, I think that we need to work kind of more on this emotional eating side on the, in our group work, because I have with the emotional eating side that we work not just individually, but also in a group dynamic to try and combine the two. Um, and that also creates, there all, there's also a kind of a lesson plan that they get through that. So it's a lot more labor intensive for them. Um, but it's also like, Hey, like, this is what we're going to be working on. Um, and it's people, and, and unfortunately there also comes with that is it is also economically prohibitive in some ways. Um, you know, I do try to offer like a scholarship here and there, but, uh, Unfortunately, because it is a time constraint for me, it's it also creates time for them. It's someone who has to have the time availability and financially be able to afford it. And so that is the, one of the things that I think is the biggest obstacle right now to all of this work is um, trying to better democratize it. Because uh, unfortunately, there is a a privilege to being able to even think about intentional weight loss or health outcomes. So this is an interesting topic, Jeb, because. I want to go back to this this idea of like social media in and of itself because it's so it it is it's it's really really hard especially with you know I I don't even remember which podcast I was listening to but if you look at like Instagram right now if we look at it in the realms of being for promotion or for for marketing or any of those things it's actually like it's not the greatest vehicle for that probably and then you have something like TikTok where if you do like video creation, you could put up three videos a day. If it's on topics such as like, you know, I just put a video up and it was like, if you do one time your ideal body weight, that's your grams of protein. But then it's like, what is beyond that? Right. And you put stuff up like that and people love it. Right. It's an entry point for them. But again, it's not the same thing. And then you have like SEO content. You have like Folks who listen to the podcast know I have a blog where I write about like all of these things, but in greater detail with more nuance. It's like there are so many different avenues. But I guess the reason why I'm bringing this up, Jeb, is because the content that you put out right now, while maybe maybe financially like someone couldn't afford uh, the price tag, because honestly, it's your hard work and it's the dedication and it's the hours you put in and it's the attention to detail you put in. I think people understand at a certain point you pay and you get exactly what you're paying for. But I think the wonderful thing is that maybe it is something like, like Instagram, you put something up and someone can see it. And that little bit of a thing, maybe it opens them up to be like, you know what, maybe, maybe this weight loss thing right now isn't what I need. Maybe, well, you know what? I, I listen to a podcast and they have a promo for like better help. Maybe I should go talk to someone about some of this stuff, right? That is the power of social media when it's in, when it's in good hands, you know? So I just want to let you know that as someone who sits and watches your stuff and has watched it for a while now, I have to say the conversations that can be sprouted from that, or the thoughts that can be sprouted from that when someone actually digests it, it's pretty powerful. It's pretty powerful stuff. You know, uh, I don't know your thoughts on that, but that's just something i I've noticed, especially the type of content I put out too. It's not, you know, it's nothing sexy. It's, it's, it's really what can be used and what can be helpful and how to start to even, no pun intended, digest any of the nutrition stuff in a way that's not going to hurt someone. You know, it, it's just an interesting line to walk too. Yeah. I think, um, I mean, Instagram, like, you know, Facebook has just become such a dumpster fire of just everything that I don't even go on it anymore, which is, um, you know, and I never really liked it that much. Instagram, I really loved Instagram when it started. Like when Instagram was like food pictures and like people just got annoyed that people were taking pictures of their food in restaurants and like tattoo artists and like graffiti, like that, I thought it was, I thought it was great. Like I loved Instagram. It was like, it was visual. And then, and I played the game. I put the Twitter posts up, but like, all of a sudden then Instagram became a visual medium where we're reading and it's like, Oh my God, here we go. People are ruining this already. And then it, now it's just a marketing tool and that's all it is. Um, you know, I, I unfortunately, and part of the reason I think that my following is small, like <laughs> is because I, I cannot like the best way to grow a following is to say really dumbed down things that everybody agrees with or that everyone disagrees with. Um, and if you can do that, like you'll have a huge following, but I can't, 
I cannot completely excise nuance. Um, and like one of the things like I posted the other day and then had a bunch of stories on it. I posted something and, and my my good friend Dr. Ben House like texted me. He's like, uh, he's like, and this is where this is where you have great friends. He's like, uh, I think you're wrong. <laughs> I was like, okay, why? And it just like goes down and like, you know, cites much like, okay, hey, you're totally right. I was like, go go write that on my uh, on my post. Because to me, it's like, okay, I could just like change the post and make it seem like, or I can be like, okay, here's a learning opportunity. Like this, because I think so often people are so afraid of conflict. They're so afraid of, um, of, of being wrong or, and let's be honest, like I was wrong in a degree of like, you know, like minuscule degree. Uh, the, the overarching point was like, I said one thing that was a little off, but it changed the intent of the entire post. And, and he was, he, you know, and he's one of those people I defer to. I mean, in I mean, I would love to say just in nutrition, but like, dude, she's one of the smartest people I've ever. I know, like, yeah, I've got a few friends with like the smartest people I've ever met, and so it's like, like I could I could argue with them, but I'm I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm probably not right, like unless it's just an argument about opinions. <laughs> so, um, but like, yeah, so I got this. I'm like, oh, this is sweet. Like, this is a, and so I kind of I would much rather like take those opportunities and kind of highlight some of that stuff. Um, and then keep some nuance. I, like, I, and I've, I've also got a good friend of ours that we met since we moved down here. She works for Meta. She does uh, like, so she's she's around so many content creators and stuff. And so we were talking, and I was like, yeah, it seems like the algorithm changed, and now it's all about reels. And she's like, yeah, she's like, try. I was like, I'm, I'm doing like a week where I test them. She's like, you got to do a month. You got to test it for like a month. So I was like, okay, so I'll do 30 reels in 30 days. Like that's kind of the thing. I'll do and I'll do a month of these. Um, and just trying to figure out how to utilize those and like, okay, like that's cool. We'll see if it works and, and it gets me more exposure. It's different, but again, it's like, am I using, like, what am I, and I'm just using some of my or other posts and blog posts and still using things that I think are helpful and they're still kind of nuanced. Um, you know, they're not dancing. I, I will never do any of these, like the trends, like I can't, like when people are pointing to the like words, I wanted to like put a gun in my mouth like it's like some of it's just so inane but um you know if i can do it with my own stamp and like you know if that means that i you know cap out at a few thousand followers or whatever i have and that's then that it is what it is it's not it's still it's still stuff that i put out and my core clientele doesn't really give a shit about instagram um in my other company that it definitely is a lot more of a driving force but like the other guys in the company have you know fifty thousand followers and stuff, so they, they they can they can shoulder the burden of the end. But they hate it too. They hate, they hate everything about it. So we're all trying to move to YouTube and more email focused because from a business standpoint, Instagram is kind of yeah. useless. Like yeah. it isn't because it's marketing. It it shows people that you can develop a following. So again, for speaking gigs, but I can also like people. You know, people say, oh, write for magazines. Like I literally wrote, I'm the only person that's written an Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, 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 Terminator workout. Like, so on the cover of men's, uh, was it Muscle and Fitness that in the last Terminator movie, I wrote the workout for the Terminator. And that was like Schwarzenegger on the cover. You know how many, and so I've written for every magazine, like every major fitness magazine. I, you know how many clients I've gotten from that directly? Probably one. One. <laughs> one and like him yeah. and I still talk. He was a young dude who like read it and was like, yeah. And I'm like, literally. And the best thing was is all the articles I wrote for all these companies was always like on hypertrophy and like workouts and things. Like I haven't worked as a trainer in five years. Um. So even when I wasn't like really like, and I'm not the, I'm not a good trainer. Like I, like my friends are all so much better at, at, as trainers than I am. Like I understand the basics and I can write a program and I can put together things that make sense. But like. I'm not that good, but I write well and I know people and people like me. And so like, yeah, I got, but it didn't, it didn't translate to business. Like all my business came from just like putting my name out there, doing good work. My email list is not big, but it's very well engaged. Like, I think that's it. So, I mean, I don't know how many people listen to it here of their own businesses or whatever, but you know, it's, so it's one of those things. It's like, is social media a net positive or, benefit or, or negative? I don't know. Um, I'm going to play the game because it's like, it's there and it, it, probably it makes me think and create content and think what are people listening to? Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think it's really interesting because, you know, I was listening to 
Mike Isertel, I think he was on Andrew Coates podcast. Uh, and they were talking about like a Renaissance periodization for folks listening to this. They're, they're an awesome company. If you want to learn about hypertrophy or even some nutrition stuff too, that's, it's a great resource. Uh, but they, yeah, they don't really focus on Instagram either. They they're, they're primarily on YouTube now. That's like their thing. It's, you know, it's, it, it's a better vehicle for education too, for learning. Well, that's we're it. Focused. It's long firm, long form, which is very different. Like in, within yeah. another company, it's like, we always are a kind of joke is Instagram to instigate YouTube blogs, email to educate. Yeah. Right. And, and look for anyone listening to this podcast. Also, you can go to my YouTube page and the long form thing will be up there too. So you can check it out however you choose to learn. But Jeb, something you put up the other day that also I was just like, ah, yeah, this is really important. And it it put up this, there was like a little bit of back and forth in the comments. And I know that it's just because it probably struck a nerve with some folks, but I was, I actually agree with you on it. It was this whole thing about the, the Met Gala and um, Kim Kardashian losing a dramatic amount of weight to fit into this dress. And I don't need to go into the details of it. Anyone listening to this, you could just use the Google machine and you can see that there was, you know, in my opinion, not some of the safest practices for someone uh, to fit some standard or to fit into a dress. Um, but then you went on the other end of it and you're like, what's the difference between Kim Kardashian and The Rock putting up this thing? And what I found really important about this, my son, he's two, right? He's two years old. And I remember growing up and watching, I grew up a really skinny, lanky kid. I was bullied by kids two years younger than me in school, all throughout school. I got to college. I was acting. And at university, they were like, hey, you're going to be in the show, but you have to go and work out so you fit this part. So you don't look malnourished and you look intimidating and you look strong and you basically fit the the standard of what a what a man is supposed to look like pretty, pretty much that's how my my brain did, is yeah like figuring it out now right. yeah right then i was like okay you know and i did the thing i went and i lifted for the first time in my life and i was eating like 4000 calories a day and i put on about 45 50 pounds holy um, shit <laughs> yeah i went from about 100 i went from about 117 pounds to 165 almost 170 how long that was throughout the course of a year i just that's never i never ate enough that's yeah. what it was you know i'm also type 1 diabetic so i had never oh. eaten enough of the things i was supposed to eat i yeah. never exercised like i had the superhero level of newbie gains but yeah i never and then I did not feel comfortable at all in that body. I just loved the attention I got. You know, here I am now getting recognized by 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 women, by by you know, to be honest, I've heard more people talk, you know, you work really hard for this, you get more attention from from men. Usually oh, yeah, yeah. like, oh yeah, what'd you do? What'd you do? Uh yeah. but you know, I don't I'm not that large anymore. I'm like about 150 pounds on a good day. Uh, but I don't eat to the point of feeling sick anymore. I work out my body feels really good now. You know, it's also been like 15 years. So I, yeah, but the thing, the reason I bring this up is because I was always doing it to try to look like a Marvel superhero. I was always doing it to try and not be bullied. I was always doing it to try and look a specific way to feel better. And in dealing with my own recovery and my own awareness of it, it's like it was trying to be fit some society standard of perfect, what we view that as. And that's why your post really resonated with me because my son, who's two, he wants to be strong like me, but we play and we goof around. And, you know, he sees all the things I do and it's not me like, I would never miss an event for a workout. I would never, I would never have all my food portioned out in a way where I couldn't enjoy you know, pizza with my son, you know, or, or with my family, you know, it's for me, my value system is different than someone else's might be for yeah. my experience. But I don't want my son to grow up in a world where he thinks what's some something like what The Rock is doing, where it's like, just never miss a day, always show up, work out at 4am, as you said, eating tilapia. And I was like, it's not it's well, not and, and banging, and banging a grand grandma tremble on a week too like that's the other thing. so 
that was my bigger thing. It's like people want to talk about this, like how first of all, it's like Kim Kardashian. My my whole so the reason I posted this and and, and I ended up using the rock because I felt that was actually I there's a you know there's a pretty famous fit so most of my irritation comes from when other fitness professionals share their like favorite fit influencer uh, who is also just a fitness professional but then talk smack about fitness influencers when it's like you're doing the same thing because most of these people are just at the point now where they're creating content to create content and a lot of the information is not good but it just fits your normal bias so you don't read it and you just throw it up there so I get really irritated because I don't follow any of those people so I don't see it so if people that I do follow, which are usually, you know, people with a couple thousand followers and feel it. So when they repost that stuff, I'm like, now you just screwed up my feed because now I got to look at this crap that I don't want to see. So then I get irritated. I have a, I have a little bit of temper. Uh, <laughs> but so I posted The Rock because I had seen someone who has almost half a million followers had posted this thing of how, what Kim was, you know, one of these voiceovers where Kim Kardashian, what she did was so terrible and it's, you know, feeding. And then I go to like, you know, there's, this same person has, uh, you know, four week transformation photos of their clients. And this person does net positive is probably on the good. So I'm not going to call that person out and say, because like, and first of all, I don't really give a shit enough about the first, the people that I want to, you know, hurt them or so I, I can take the rock. The rock is not going to mind that I used him as a model for this. So I'll just throw that in there. But my point for that was that Kim was going for a very specific event what people were actually angry about was that she was honest about what she did when I guarantee you that 90% of the people that were on that red carpet did the exact same thing, but just acted like this is a normal standard of beauty that everyone should be able to attain. I've worked, I worked in fashion for over a decade as a hairdresser. Like I know what happens. I I'm backstage at shows. I've done hair of models on, you know, every major magazine that you've ever seen all the supermodels I worked with all of them. I know what they do. And, and then I know what the photographers do afterwards to make it even more unrealistic. So to pretend that she was doing something A that's and different than anyone else was doing, and then to, and trust me, I am the, like there's no one on earth probably that thinks it's more ridiculous that the Kardashians exist as a, 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 a cultural icons. I, I think it's ridiculous. And I think it's a, um, when I get mad about social media, I get mad because, like reality TV has given a platform to people like that. I, I think they're, I think they're bad for humanity, but I will still defend her in this, in this, in this realm because she just did. And then she went out for donuts and pizza afterwards and like showed that as well and said like, Hey, this and the fact that they, she also showed she didn't even fit in the dress. She lost 18 pounds, but to fit into Marilyn Monroe's dress was such an insane task that she didn't make it. So they had to do a bunch of stuff to get her in there. And she stayed in it for like two hours. They took it off and had a replacement dress that actually fit for her. But then The Rock uses, you know, super physiological amounts of drugs. And people are like, oh, he's on, like a lot of people in my comments are like, oh, I didn't realize he does, he does steroids. And I'm like, the guy is in his 40s. Look at him when he's in his 20s. Like he, look, and trust me, that doesn't happen. Like it's still genetics, hard work, like tons of, like the guy is in a, he's a, he is a, 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 seems like an amazing human being, but to venerate him as like this, you know, hero and just the pinnacle of hard work and success. And to say that she's, you know, destroying America at a time when um, women's body autonomy is under attack from, you know, politicians telling a woman that she is not allowed to utilize her body in the way that she sees fit to what she wants to look like is to me just so frigging um hypocritical and it it angered me in a way and and and, and I, the problem i see with most of the fitness industry is there there's almost zero self-awareness for most people um they will stand on the mountaintop and, and champion something and then you say the same thing in a different way and they don't realize that it's the same thing well, no, no, it's not the same thing as this, that, that, the other. And then when you say like, okay, what about this, 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 this? Well, that, you know, not, it just doesn't count because it doesn't fit their bias. People just want to have their opinion. And I'm not even saying I'm right. Like, I'm just saying like, this is, if you, if it, if it, if it made people, if it bothered people, maybe, maybe that's why. Yeah. I mean, I think the thing that I take away from that, Jeb, is this idea of our identities getting wrapped 
in the things that we consume, right? So if I if I saw, if I'm someone who has received inspiration from someone like The Rock or even someone like uh, Kim Kardashian, maybe they've both been motivating factors for me. And then someone says like, well, you know, what they did might not be realistic for you or what they did, you know, there are a lot of people doing that and they're being honest right now. You know, it's almost like, but I built myself on this idea. Like, it, yeah. it, you know, that's the harder thing, I think, for someone to actually process. And that's also the harder thing when you're working with a client to be, you know, I, I, you know, to be like, yeah, I don't know if you're going to look like X person. I know that you, I know what goes into looking that way. You could try. I mean, we could try that. You know, it's. I can tell you, I know that you're probably not going to look like The Rock, because I'll, 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 and one of the things that I can always do if someone says that's what I want to look like is I'll just take a picture of his dad and show him, and like this is what his dad looks like. This guy has got one of the greatest physiques I've ever seen in my life, and he wrestled three hundred times a year and made like thirty grand a year or whatever. Like he was doing this on like canned beans and beer. <laughs> like you ain't got, you ain't got this kind of genetics yeah um, yeah if you do you don't i'm not the guy to work with i've got there's people that you can work with that that will take you to the next level and i don't really have right it, it there's there's a lot that goes into it and i think it gets hard because people just so and again not to generalize i think people just want there to be a solution if i choose to look a specific way then i can get where i want to go and I don't think a lot of people like to talk about no, the things that but, are required for that. But I think there's also this blowback too. And this is why I always talk about being in that kind of messy middle and how that is a, a place to be. And you, you know, you brought up Josh, Josh and I spoke for the first time, like about maybe a year or so ago um, and didn't know each other for some reason, just never crossed paths. I don't know why, but we, we literally had like almost the same kind of philosophies on, on like everything. Like, it's very, like we, independently come up with this kind of skills based thing and like um you know the skills we use are different but like still that same idea of like instead of trying to use numbers and stuff like using skills and um and you know him uh gabriel fandaro i've been friends with for a long time and, and she's obviously been a big influence in that kind of melding her and i her and i both kind of you know same thing on this like one side of the spectrum and then like had to come back here and then kind of figure out the middle um and then um recent more recently i, I started connecting more with uh, uh a woman named uh, amelia thompson who's uh, a phd of uk who i just i adore like she's um i don't know she's just super first of all she's got a, a, a killer sense of humor and is one of the driest most sarcastic people but also just very smart and falls in that that middle as well um and these are all people and, and then of course my good friend dr ben house who, who you know covers the science side and he's really gotten into the behavioral side a lot lately but understanding that, that those things are all part and parcel, but we also kind of sometimes, um, because in, in that space, all of us are people that exercise, that actually, you know, we do have, and I'm not saying we have positive or negative body image stuff, but we all work out and we, we kind of maintain a physical appearance that we find important. Um, and we find it important for ourselves. One of the things for me is, um, you know, and I, I I don't know what the the deep, you know, I'm not a big find your deep why person because I think that'll be found on its own. I think people put too much work into that and use it to procrastinate on actually doing anything. But you know, there's a deeper why to why I want always wanted to be bigger, right? And like I look back on my life and I always wanted to be like a 200 pound muscled guy covered in tattoos, and uh, I got to do that. Like, that's cool. Like, it's cool. Like, I got to do that. Like, I got to be the guy that I wanted to be when I was a kid. And I didn't until I was in like my late 30s. Because, you know, at that point, I was just like, I'm never actually going to have a real job. So, like, it's cool. I can get finger tattoos. And, I'm, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm losing my hair. So, let's just get rid of it. And, you know, let's keep working out. And, um, but, like, I like that. And, like, could I be leaner for Instagram? Sure. But, again, we talk about that. I don't really care that much. So, it's like. Uh, I don't know, but but like at the same time, it's like there's also nothing wrong with like wanting. Look, like for me, I I I can't, you know I also do jujitsu. I trained MMA. I trained in boxing. I trained all these things. All you know, much of my life, and I I realized I lived in a lot of rough neighborhoods, and I've came to realize too that there's also this part of me that like 
being bigger, covering tattoos and bald, uh, made my, started making my life a lot easier um, because like, I'm just not going to get screwed with. And I realized it was actually like a protective mechanism, um, which also gets shattered when I go to jiu-jitsu because there's hundred, like, you know, I can get my ass kicked by 140 pounds of vegan. So, you know, they all sudden all this, but in real life, it's, it's pretty protective. And, and, you know, I've been in some bad situations and, you know, I think part of me was like, yeah, I'm trying to, trying to avoid that. So there, everything is so multifactorial that, that that's why when we talk about like, it's not my job to judge someone's uh, desires. You know, if they're like, yeah, you know what? I want a six pack. Cool. And, you know, like if, if that's all you want, are you willing to do X, Y, and Z to get there? Yeah. Do you have this history of like having issues with these things? No cool let's go let's hammer it and be like yeah and we do and now i want to tell you it's going to suck to get there and it's probably not going to be super sustainable um but you can decide that you know once you do it but at the same time then someone who's like um i hate my body you know it's like okay like we know that it's not really about the body it's like how do we start to fix these other things um and you talk again back to josh about acceptance and commitment therapy uh you know the it's the um i think it was act it might have been another one abt there's a couple of them that will use acceptance in the um in the, the the title but uh one of the most uh successful interventions done was an acceptance-based therapy and it utilized um basically the you know one of the big things that a lot of people in the industry you know kind of fight with a lot and i think now it's becoming a little bit better because i mean again i don't really communicate with the discipline voices that are like, oh, you just got to, you know, grit your teeth. Um, but it shows that acceptance, like, is not passive. It's not, uh, you know, giving up. Like, if, in order to take action, you kind of have to accept where you are first. And so we can actually look at research that shows one of the best interventions with people that accept, we use this acceptance-based therapy with, you know, pretty heavy counseling and then a lot of other work. But um if people can start to just work on that little piece then we can start to be like okay like what what are these other things that are going on um and then that and so so intentional weight loss that might not be right for someone right now doesn't mean it won't be right for them in two years maybe it will maybe it won't i don't know yeah i think there's like a there's a spectrum right we just yeah. have to look at where someone is existing currently on that spectrum of things right we got we got where you do n absolutely nothing at all versus going too far right we have mm -hmm. to we have to see where someone is on that and that's why i'm a big proponent of just something just try something it's all it's yeah. the only way you're going to have to figure out if if this is even the right thing because if you open up that conversation and someone says like i hate my body and you say well what have you tried in the past and their response is absolutely nothing I just feel this way, then it's okay. We have a different conversation. We have a different toolbox that we're going to be borrowing from. Verse, I don't like the way my body looks. I've tried like 50 different diets. They never really work for me. Cool. We have another set of tools that we work with. Like it's just, it's this, this nuanced conversation that we get to have. And in the process, we understand that, okay, what am I able to do versus what am I able not to do? What's holding me back here? What allows me to move forward? It's a really powerful thing. However, if someone was to come out and say this or try and sell this or to show it that way, unfortunately, it's not as appealing for, for the masses. Unfortunately, you know, that's the, that's the thing. And to loop it back to what we were talking about earlier, I think it's rad that you know your end user, you know the person that you're talking to. That's the thing that's most important. Yeah. Uh, you know, and for your other business, you know, whether it be the, uh, I think it's nutrition compound, is that? Is com that com compound performance, yeah. So, compound so performance. yeah, I run the, uh, my myself and my my good friend, Dean Glio, we run the, the nutrition realm. So compound performance is uh, Kyle Dobbs started a company um, and it was a, it's a, it's a, performance, you know, uh, sports performance, like, and then him and uh, Matt Domney came on and now Craig Owens on. Um, 
I just shout out to all the guys because uh, they're literally like I, I I I had no desire in doing anything else. I was just in my private practice. We kind of had a meeting, and I was like, I'll kind of be here for support, you know, and we'll talk about this. But like, I, so Kyle is the person I one of the only people I actually trust. A bit. And him and I, he helped me develop the plan for my private practice when I went out on my own. Even though he doesn't do nutrition or anything, it's all the same with. And um, he's just super pragmatic and practical. So we had this conversation and we, and they run a mentorship and um, we were like, you know, I, I think this would it'd be cool to add a nutrition element. And they're like, we don't want anything to do with nutrition. Like if you guys will do it, do it. <laughs> and so we partnered with them and we're doing the nutrition stuff and we just all, you know, you come back to values. Um, you know, it's, it was like, it, it became the thing of like, I don't care if we never make a dime doing this. Uh, I like you guys. We all share the same values and we have a shitload of fun. Um, so it's like, let's just do something. And so that's how we, we kind of developed that and started working together, um, with that side. And so we, so Dean and I do the nutrition side and we have this mentorship. And again, that's where we talk about the coaching strategy spectrum is like running the gamut. And we have a lot of guest speakers in there. We're actually going to be, um, launching our next round of the mentorship on the 28th. We've got a, a webinar, the 18th, that a uh, free webinar that if anyone wants to sign up, it's, it's up there on the website. Um, yeah, so for nutrition coaches, or actually anyone who's even interested in nutrition, like in becoming or, or learning more about it, we don't go into the physiological points because honestly, like you buy a book for that. Um, you know, it, it, it'd be a waste of people's time to go through that. We actually bring on other friends of ours, a lot of experts that, that um, you know, again, God Fondaro, Mike T. Nelson, uh, Ben House, um, uh, who else we had on there? Tara Arndt, who she doesn't really work with them anymore but she did all my email stuff because it's like that's super important like understanding email um yeah and so uh, we're hoping to have a few new guests andrew coach you mentioned he's on it he's gonna come back again next semester because we're all super close um and mike dole and mike dole is on there brad Dieter from macros inc i always had like lots of cool friends on there but like to help people understand um coaching and how to be a better coach uh and and the, it, there's you know, and then Dr. Lisa Lewis, she's on there, she says, you know, all the time, all roads lead to Rome. It's like, how can we get, we all have a common goal. And we just, the more tools we have in our coaching spectrum, the better chance we have of helping someone to get there. Um, and just understanding that, that the goal isn't always weight loss, even though that's probably the goal of your clients all the time. It's figuring out what other, what the weight loss leads to. And that's where like the why conversation, like that, it kind of makes more sense. Like, well, why do you want to lose the weight, right? Like to me, it's when people go for the, like, I hate the Simon Sinek. I hate when people think business stuff and try and turn it into nutrition and fitness because um, it's not the same. Um, but yeah, so like that, we just kind of cover that stuff. But I think that's, you know, to your point, it's the spectrum of stuff. And that's where we, you know, kind of live and like, how can we, figure out where to be better on it and that, that's what i try to do every day and like you know that's one of the things i think i posted about that too is that's why i call what i do a practice i don't i don't like i don't know like i'm totally different than i was three years ago and i'm just practicing what i'm doing and hopefully i'll be totally different from where i am in three years and hopefully it's 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 a, it's a better helping people but i know that my most progress now is that i just i, I listen a lot more like I don't like coaching is very different now, and and also it's also my business model from a monetary standpoint is terrible. Like don't ever fall because like I spend a lot of time with people. I do phone calls with every single person. Um, it's not the way to make a lot of money. It's just it's a good it's a good way to to be connected with people. But it's not a great way to make a lot of money. Yeah. Well, I think you also have to look at it. You know, because first of all, if anyone wants to find out more about any of that, I'll have links to it in the show notes as well. Jeb, uh, your social media, I'll have links there, even though you're trying, you're trying to be more active on there, but trying. Yeah. What I wanted to say in regards to that, you know, I'm going to be honest, the thought just went out of right out of my head. I'm sure it was something really good. Uh, it, was, it was very poetic and um, very in insightful. I'm sorry you all yeah. are missing it. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> but either way, um, I want to ask you, you know, because I know you have some other time commitments 
I mean, ah, I do remember for the next. Uh, I'm pretty good for you know, if we, like another 15 minutes, so not anything until. Oh, sweet. Next bit, so yeah. uh, well, two parts. I remember what I was going to say. It's that you know, from a business standpoint, what you're trying to do really isn't about working with a thousand people at once. No. You know, you, it's it's really it's really impossible to work with a large amount of people and pay attention to all those all the biofeedback, all the emotional regulation work, all the, like, it's just, it's a lot, but in and of itself, you call it, you call it, like you said, like when I was running my practice, that's, that's what it is. It's not, it's not where you're trying to have quick turnaround. It's not. Mm -hmm. And, and that's something that someone, no matter where they are in their nutrition journey, that, that we can kind of be aware of. It's like, what am I trying to do right now? Why am I trying to have it be rapid? If it is rapid, I have to have the understanding that it means it's not going to be sustainable. That's the that's the thing that takes time to understand. And it probably means like if you're hearing that and it's it's ruffling your feathers, it probably means you're not at the point where working with someone like Jeb or even where working with someone like myself, it might not be, it might just be, that's not where you are in your journey yet. And it's okay. We absolutely support you where you are in your journey. That's oh, the yeah. beautiful thing. We totally support you there. That's what I want you to take away from this is that you're supported like you, you 100% are, um, especially if you do wind up coming to one of us or any of the amazing people that Jeb talked about, you're always going to be supported. That's the beautiful thing about the style of coaching that each of us has. And my final question for you, Jeb, is if you could go back to yourself when you first started doing all of this. What is one piece of advice that you would give yourself? Um, I'm such a um, kind of freak about like, I would never change anything because everything I've done led me to where I am now. And I'm, I, I don't have regrets. And like, so um, I wouldn't tell me myself anything to change anything. Um, I, I think the better the be, the way I can rephrase this, I can answer it without like violating my own personal uh, like kind of values or, or uh, for lack of a better term, would be um, the idea that like if if I was to talk when I talk to younger professionals, like what is the advice I'd give them, and it's um, you know, just 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 do your best. Um, the quote on my Instagram page is from Marshall Linehan, who's the, the person who started dialectical behavior therapy, which is where I take a lot of, of my um, practice from. And it's, we're all doing the best we can, and we can do better. Um, and that, to me, is the, the pinnacle of acceptance, right? I am where I am. I am who I am. And I can do better. It's dialectical. Yes, they are two opposing truths that coexist. And that is, to me, the way forward. Um, and you're going to make mistakes. You're going to fail. Uh, you're going to have successes. Don't overvalue those. Um, actually there's a cool, like, it's one of these stupid things that comes up on Instagram. I actually love Instagram because I get like these things that are so cheesy and dumb, but they're kind of awesome. It was like Tom Hanks and Jamie Foxx. And it's like, I do know, comedian sitting around. And, um, they were talking about like some old actor who was like, yeah, you know, like, you're gonna have a flop or whatever, and it's cool. Like time, time, you know, time moves on. And then you're gonna be a huge success. Guess what? No one cares, time moves on. So, you know, don't overvalue or devalue one or the other. Like they're just moments in time. They're done, move on from them. Um, learn what you can and, and kind of take it from there. But, um, and then probably also to value your relationship. I mean, I, I, I will 100% say that all of my success in, in, in life has been from my relationships. Um, there's people out there who be like, don't network, it's stupid. I'm like, okay, well, that's because you're obviously a, have a terrible personality and people don't want to be around you. Um, it, you know, like my, I see it as my responsibility to help young professionals succeed um, because so many people helped me to get where I am. And, uh, you know, I still remember, you know, I mean, there's people like, smitty jim smith who's like diesel crew who was like the first guy on youtube doing exercise videos he was huge he's business partners with uh defranco in, in their certification now 
And um, I just remember him like always being like, if you ever need anything and like dead serious, like, you know, let me know. I remember, you know, sitting down with Ben Bruno, who's like super famous, world famous trainer now. And him being like, he's like, yeah, he's like, just go take a personal trainer cert. He's like, if you need help getting a job, I'll get you a job anywhere in, in New York City. Like, you know, just let me know. And I didn't take that. Or, or sitting down with like someone like Don Saladino, who owned like one of the nicest gyms in New York, or uh, a guy like Pat Davidson, who made me question everything I know. And same with Ben House. Like, so like all these people had such direct. And then I always have to say my, my one of my best friends, Sean Heisen, like that he was the uh, editor at, at Muscle and Fitness, Men's Fitness, and kind of drew me into this world. I was just a hair, I was a hairdresser, you know, in New York City, and like we started working out together, and he like just it was like a master class of physical culture. But like, just take those relationships and, and realize what they are, um, and then pass it on. Like you know, I mean, you're you know you're in recovery. Like you know, I always say, the best blessing I ever had was was being an alcoholic and like all the shit that is you know would be considered a nightmare for most people i'm like it gave me the perspective of where i am now yeah i mean i still think about like uh, i remember sitting in one day unloading dishwasher and being like you know if one little thing had gone a different way in 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 one of my like you know uh trials that i have i would be in prison right now so like the fact that i'm able to unload my dishwasher is like a blessing and uh you know that makes things easier. Yeah, it's uh, it's perspective. Literally, yeah. everything you just talked everything. about is, is is perspective, and I think that's a beautiful way to end the episode because that's literally what we've been talking about the whole time. It's how you can view your journey and how you can begin to grow along that journey. That's literally what it is. Because none of us want to be stagnant. We all want growth, and there's discomfort with growth. I think so right it's it's literally the entire thing we've been talking about in some regard so look if you're listening to this podcast and you enjoyed it or you you're coming across my podcast for the first time because you know jeb and you wanted to hear him talk about amazing things uh you could do me a favor and you can drop a five star review and subscribe really appreciate it because more folks will be able to hear the episode and hear the fantastic things that jeb had to say so thank you again jeb and for everyone listening Go do amazing things because you can.